Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for making it over here to CSIS. My name is Kathleen Hicks. I direct the International Security Program here at CSIS. I am not Heather Connolly, who's listed on your program. Heather um, was uh, trapped in Florida, of all places, by uh, canceled flights yesterday. So the good news is she ended up in a place with the warmest weather in the US. The bad news is there are no flights going there, so she couldn't get out. <clears throat> I have the distinct pleasure today of introducing Ermes Rensselu, the Minister of Defense of the Republic of Estonia. Mr. Rensselu has been the Minister of Defense since May of 2012, and he's been a member of the Estonian Parliament since 2003. Prior to 2003, he was a lecturer at the Estonian Academy of Security Studies and also has held a number of positions advising the Estonian government. We are privileged to have Minister Rensselo here today to discuss Estonia's defense priorities and its military modernization plans ahead of the September 2014 NATO summit. After the minister's remarks, he and I will discuss some of the issues most relevant to Estonia's defense, and then we will open up this session to questions from the audience. So please join me now in a round of applause for Minister Urmus Rensselu. Thank you very much for warm uh, welcoming words. Um, well, I'm coming from the Nordic country where we are having exceptional situation that uh, over the decades that in this winter we do not have snow. So um, um, I'm um, delighted to be here. And um, first of all, I, I, I'm very proud that uh, among us are two helicopter pilots from the Estonian Air Forces who have served in Afghanistan with U.S. troops and uh, now serve in uh, Maryland, uh, Maryland uh, National Guard. So I truly welcome you here. Um, this year we will mark a number of very important anniversaries in the U.S.-European relationship. 100 years since Sarajevo and the outbreak of World War I, 70 years since Normandy, 65 years since the Washington Treaty was signed, quarter of a century since the Berlin Wall fell, and um, by the steps 15, 10, and 5 years since NATO's post-Cold War enlargements. So it is a moment for us to look back to what we have achieved so far and to assess the way ahead. NATO, along with the European Union, uh, was a natural choice for Estonia after regaining independence in 1991. Membership in democratic Western organizations was and still is seen as the core pillar of Estonian security. And this goal was a great engine for reforms back in the 90s. Last year, 76% of Estonians supported NATO membership. 58 of the population believes that Estonian Defence Forces should participate in international military operations when they can. And I'm proud to say that actually uh, all the time it has been that when we in Parliament vote international missions, it is a consensus vote. Because of our history, people still remember that peace and security does not come for free. Europe will and free is something wonderful and highly valuable, but it is also a threat uh, to our vigilance. We shouldn't forget that we still need to maintain our defense capabilities and contribute to the alliance. There have been many discussions about NATO's role and its relevance during the past 20 years. But we must keep in mind what has been achieved. With the end of the Cold War, the global security environment changed almost overnight, and NATO adapted to it. Throughout the entire period of the Cold War, NATO forces were not involved in a single military engagement. And since that time, NATO has been engaged in missions that cover the full spectrum of crisis management operations, from combat and peacekeeping, to training and logistics support, to surveillance and humanitarian relief. And today, just under 100,000 military personnel are engaged in NATO missions around the world. And NATO alone, NATO alone continues to provide that kind of multinational interoperability, command structure, and deployable capabilities. 
NATO still is the most powerful military alliance in the world. Indeed, it hasn't always been easy. Many great soldiers have lost their lives, including nine Estonians in Afghanistan. But NATO has proven that it is able and willing to adapt, reform and prove that it is still relevant. And NATO has been an adaptable organization. Decisions made during different rounds of uh, enlargement are a proof of, of that. The risk to take in seven more Eastern European countries decade ago turned out to be a worthy one. The security of the Euro-Atlantic community has considerably improved through enlargement of NATO. However, we can't take this achievement for granted because security needs constant commitment and improvement, especially in today's increasingly unpredictable and complex world. So NATO has to remain active and find ways to engage more its most committed and strong partners. At the summit in coming months, we must reconfirm that we value their contribution and that NATO's doors remain open to new members. And this is not a consensus understanding today, I'm sure. We should encourage and help aspirant countries more so that they can prepare better for the NATO's membership. I will not stop on a few other things we wish to see among the conclusions of the NATO summit. First, a recommitment to the 2% defense spending principle. In the last few years, almost all allies have cut their defense budgets, some by more than 40%. Today, five countries out of 28 spend less than 1% of their GDP to defense. Only five spend uh, more than 1.75% uh, 1 among which four countries cross the 2% threshold. Only four. And in 90s it was 12. The NATO Secretary General's annual report of 2012 cautioned that if the negative defense spending trend of member countries continued, NATO's military capability and political credibility could be put at risk. It seems that we are outraged by the costs of war, but we are even more outraged by the costs of peace. And we should not consider Europe as one homogeneous area where all the countries think and act at the same time. Estonia is one of the countries that understands the necessity to continuously contribute 2% of GDP to defence and who actually does so. So actually, when I, 2012, became minister, so it was the first year we achieved the uh, 2%. And now we have a decade plan, and, uh, and we will remain fit on that level. But the biggest difficulty is to maintain th this level when many of us, especially our neighbors, don't respect their commitments. And therefore, it is uh, of utmost importance that the NATO summit reaffirmed the 2% principle. We need to keep this as a goal, even if stating this goal will not automatically and instantly change the defense budgets in Europe. Because if it's vice versa, if we will uh, lose that benchmark, it will automatically, I'm sure, bring additional cuts. Second, at the summit, NATO must reconfirm its ability and commitment to fulfill all its main tasks, both Article 5 and non-Article 5, on NATO soil and far from it. The Baltic region is the only one in NATO, the only one in NATO where the military strategic balance does not favor the Allies uh, because of our good friend Russia. Thus, NATO as a whole, as well as the Allies in B or multilateral cooperation, must continue to ensure that no outside power is tempted into making a miscalculation, neither testing the solidarity of NATO allies, nor the functioning of uh, Article 5. And the good work we have done in demonstrating the political unity and decisiveness of the alliance must con continue true. First, contingency planning and conducting exercises on a regular basis. 
Second, sending unambitious, clear and consistent messages to third parties. Both contingency planning and exercises should be a normal and routine part of NATO's work, not something to be shy about. And third, the continued strength of the transatlantic link is also one of the main topics of the summit for us. We wish to see the US committed to Europe and the European allies committed to a fairer burden sharing. And this is a challenge for Europe and we will remain to raise the question among our European allies. And there is also a question of burden sharing inside Europe that needs to be addressed. Well, many, I on the city and elsewhere, myself included, are frustrated with European level of defence spending capabilities and willingness to take part in international military operations. We should not forget that between 2007 and 11, an average of 30 to 40,000 non-US NATO troops were deployed to Afghanistan, which means on average between 30 to 40 American soldiers who didn't have to go to Afghanistan. There is no other region in the world besides Europe who contributes in such a way to an American-led military operation. At the same time, the last US tank departed from Europe in March 2013. I don't know where that tank is now, but we miss that tank. While I understand the financial difficulties you face, I still have to underline the importance of American presence and visibility in Europe and in the Baltic Sea region in particular, which reinforces NATO's credibility and deterrence posture. In times of diminished resources for defence, having reliable allies willing to share the burden of collective defence becomes even more important. But this seems to be commonly ignored. According to the survey Transatlantic Trends 2013, only 15% of Americans felt that NATO helps countries share the cost of military action. And only 12% of Europeans said the same. This means that there is a lot of room for improvement. As Churchill said, gentlemen, we have run out of money and now we have to think. In the Baltic states we have practiced what is called today smart defense for more than a decade. I was not, uh, it was not because we were smart, but because we were small and poor. For example, officers of the free countries are trained in the one single institution, Baltic Defense College, since 1919. We have a joint air surveillance system, BaltNet, and a common mine countermeasure unit, Baltron. Uh, and in 2016, we will send an Estonian-led Baltic battalion to the NATO response force. Our region is, of course, wider than just the free Baltic states. As specific initiatives, I could mention the Nordic Battle Group, which includes on Estonian initiative all Nordic Baltic countries who can contribute. Finland, Sweden, Ireland, Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia. We also coordinate our participation in international military operations. We take part of EUTM, which is a uh, training mission of European Union in Mali, in cooperation with Finland, Sweden and Lithuania. And we are currently in discussion about our contribution to resolute support in Afghanistan, in cooperation with Nordic Baltic countries and Germany. Another topic at the summit will be the Alliance's continued preparedness and interoperability once the ISAF mission comes to its end. As General Breedlove said when he was in Tallinn in Estonia last fall, the Alliance is currently at the pinnacle of our interconnectedness. But from the next year, the glue will start to unstick. To avoid this, NATO must focus more on exercises. 
ex exercises are the sine qua non of combat readiness. It is also important politically as it demonstrates NATO's continued relevance and contributes to the alliance's deterrence posture. And therefore, the Connected Forces Initiative is one of the core issues for Estonia. We hope to see a robust, forward-looking exercise program with annual live exercises, annual live exercises, put in place. And these exercises should take place all over the alliance on both sides of the Atlantic. To say a few words about the latest NATO exercises, in November, steadfast just live exercise took place in Poland and in the Baltic states and cyber coalition that took place in Estonia. Steadfast chess was the first large-scale Article 5 live exercise since the Cold War. It is also worth mentioning that this time Allies exercised defending a real country, and this country is my homeland, Estonia. So we Estonians have very sentimental feelings about that exercise. As the scenario foresaw the defense of Estonia by the Alliance, NATO headquarters prepared for that for more than a year. And as a result, now we are much better acquainted with our region and its security challenges. And steadfast chess strengthened the alliances to Tenas Pusha in our region. And it also gave Allied forces and NATO headquarters the opportunity to exercise in a collective defense scenario. But what we learned is that our long engagement in counterterrorism type wars in failed states has changed our mindset. It really has driven us away from the collective defense approach. The country who was the biggest contributor to the life phase of state was chess was France with 1,200 participants the second was Poland, who contributed uh, 1,000 troops. And uh, uh, bronze medal, same level, was to the US and Estonia. Both contributed uh, with a company size unit. And I, I don't think this proportion was quite a normal. About Cyber Coalition, it was uh, an honor for us to host in Estonia NATO's annual cyber defense exercise. It was the first time this exercise took place outside of shape. Cyber Coalition 2013 involved 400 people in 32 different countries and it was a success. We hope to continue hosting such cyber exercises in Estonia as training, education, and exercises are clearly supporting our nation and also NATO's capability development. We have gained a lot of experience in this field and we have interested into relevant infrastructure development which should be shared with our allies. Estonia as a country has understood that cyber is an integral part of today's security environment and of every single future conflict of crisis. And therefore, we are uh, working closely with our allies to improve states national cyber defense capabilities and the Alliance's collective cyber policy. And uh, our view is that cyber should also play a bigger role in, fu in future NATO's exercises. So, long military engagements have given us more than just interoperability. They have given us a trustful relationship. You can surge trust and you can't surge a major relationship. Uh, trust and relationships take many years to build. Person-to-person -person connections are only available because you have gone to school together or because you have endured hardships together. And we highly value the relationship we have built with the US on the field of Afghanistan and in Iraq. Nothing can replace the actual combat experience side by side. And we wish to maintain this link after the end of ISAF mission and to find new openings for cooperation. To sum in all up and in anticipation of your questions, we in Estonia hope to see a balanced NATO 
capable of fulfilling all of its three core tasks. First, collective defense. Second, crisis management. And third, cooperative security. And NATO currently has a good framework. The strategic concept adopted at the Lisbon summit in uh, November 2020, which give clear, balanced and fair guidelines. And we, we don't see a need to make revolutionary reforms, but rather just focus on NATO's core tasks and to improve national contributors. Despite pervasive pessimism about the ultimate success of the NATO mission in Afghanistan and continued debate about European contributions to allied burden sharing, 55% of Americans and 58% of Europeans see NATO, st see NATO as still essential for their country's security according to the last year's study of transatlantic trends. NATO's main value will be, will, uh, was to be an alliance of democratic countries that should act together. It means that there is a lot worth preserving and we need to do common efforts to the same. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that um, both thorough speech but also very provocative um, talk and I, I think there's a lot here for us to, to dig into. The first I think um, of the comments you made that I, I was struck by was the recommitment to the 2% metric which of course is something we really struggled with in the alliance um, for some time as you rightly point out the statistics on that. Um, I, I think the real question, though, for us has to be how, how can we be persuasive, most persuasive on this? Um, if we use your uh, thought that without having it, we might be in more of a free fall than, than with having it, what do you think can most persuade those countries that aren't currently making the 2% uh, in the absence of an overwhelming threat? Let's just assume that might be persuasive. Um, and their sense of an overwhelming threat. What do you think those of us who are making the mark can do to be persuasive to other countries? Um, well, I try, try, to try to avoid to be provocative. Oh, no, provocative <laughs> is a good thing. Okay, right. <laughs> okay. not in a Nordic country. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think what is most important is actually to uh, applaud the success stories. And... Um, I'm, I'm time to time also in NATO and European Union defense ministerials, I hear the sayings that, okay, but we have like a prisoner's dilemma. Whether we balance, we try to balance in, uh, during the turmoil of financial crisis our national budgets or whether we, will, we have to make the cuts to defense. Estonia has proven it is possible to, de to do the both. The, these are not contradictory uh, aims. We do have a balanced budget. Uh, our structural budget is, is uh, balanced. We do have smallest uh, national debt in EU. And we, we have been succeeded to move against the tide in Europe, which means uh, during the times when um, there are co my fellow partner co countries are doing the cuts to the defense uh, uh, spending, we are doing vice versa. We are recruiting uh, more uh, men and women to the army. We are buying new weaponry, etc. And of course, we are no, not doing it for just for fun. Uh, but, but this is our view of security, that also a small country needs to be a net provider of the security. And I think this, is, this should be a cornerstone of the, of the um, way to show also the uh, European allies uh, the way forward. And the second, I think, is uh, that uh, the very clear and sound messages what the U.S. has uh, given, um, as uh, Secretary Hegel also very clearly uh, put to the message that uh, uh, Europe has to understand that this will not be sustainable, that domestic scene in the U.S. will one day uh, just block it because of... Uh, the, the, the uh, viewpoint of fairness, and the European, uh, we as European allies altogether have to understand it and not to turn 
to the, the NATO to the, such a negative scenario. So those are, uh, those are the, I think, the cornerstones now. That brings to mind, of course, smart defense and how, how um, countries can contribute. And the Baltics and the Nordic states have had this great um, example already. What um, lessons do you think that that Nordic-Baltic cooperation, what, what lessons can that provide to other states in Europe who are looking at a smart defense approach? Well, to be honest, I'm actually a little bit uh, worried about the overusing the word smart defense in an euphemistic way of excusing the defense cuts. Okay, it doesn't matter how much money we will put in, but we work on the, uh, just on the list of outputs. That is something which is also commonly heard. And so, uh, from the zero you can't uh, do positive thing, uh, which is like self-evident. Uh, so, but um, the smart defense, I think, uh, very good example of smart defense uh, from, from our region is indeed a, a permanent uh, air policing over the Baltic sky. And I'm happy to inform you that from the last Friday, the uh, US pilots, uh, US planes are now taking uh, their duty to defend uh, Estonian, Latvian, Lithuanian uh, uh, sky space uh, for a half a year. Um, and um, uh, I'm, 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 um, uh, I'm very positive also about the uh, security and defense dimension of the um, uh, European Union, uh, where uh, I think uh, the uh, com joint procurements and also uh, uh, programs of developing uh, certain new uh, uh, security weaponry systems uh, have turned to be a successful ones. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the U.S. Air Force participation in the Baltic air policing, and, and you also, in your um, talk, spoke about the last tank, U.S. tank, leaving, leaving Europe. Um, what do you think are the most critical U.S. capabilities for defense of European territory? What can the U.S. focus itself on if it needs to focus in terms of um, providing capabilities forward into Europe? What makes the most impact with, with you and with your public? I think, um, and our region, as I mentioned, is a, like a special area uh, in the, of the Europe because of, we are indeed the only area of, uh, of uh, NATO where we have a like, minority uh, military capability looking to the third, uh, comparing to the third countries. Um, I think uh, the most important is a complex of, uh, of uh, different actions which could be, which could be labeled as a presence. This is a uh, exercises, this is a uh, visits, this is uh, indeed very clear and sound uh, political statements when they are needed. And uh, Surely, the uh, crown jewel would be uh, the permanent presence of the uh, U.S. Um, troops in European soil. I would be uh, most pleased to see permanent uh, U.S. presence in, uh, in, the, um, uh, in my homeland, but uh, I understand the realities today. But uh, Baltic countries are a special case and uh, as much as presence of U.S. could pr produce, so I think as, uh, as efficient uh, it will be also to encourage uh, European countries to, to, to fulfill their responsibility. Because it's in a way like, a, again, a prisoner's dilemma. If the U.S. domestic scene looks that European countries are out, so European countries look okay, they are now moving a pivot towards uh, Pacific. And so, uh, so this is like something we have to avoid that both, uh, uh, both uh, ships are going, uh, uh, going like far away from each other. What is your sense of the U.S. rebalance 
approach and how it's being received in Europe and how uh, the U.S. has spoken to Europe about its strategy. Mm -hmm. Is uh, it worrisome? Is it understandable? How do you think you'd characterize well, it? Well, I, I consider it positive that actually you, U.S. Take, uh, takes the seriously the need to explain uh, what their uh, agenda is. And, uh, and so uh, mm, uh, Secretary Hegel in NATO ministerials have given very uh, has given a very like sound comments on mm -hmm. that, but surely, especially uh, mm, Eastern European countries' call of uh, U.S. being uh, being uh, being as a real and uh, shown uh, actor in the in the area is is, is will be consistent one. So uh, I think um, surely we are. We understand the, the, the financial challenges also and the U.S. Army reform, which is a uh, forehead, but uh, the presence could be also produced in, a, in the most, let's say, cost-efficient ways, especially in our region as we, we see it. And uh, we would be very much appreciate if the, it in uh, coming, uh, coming times uh, will be on our, uh, uh, on the agenda of alliance or bilateral cooperation. Mm, very good. All right, let me open it up to the audience. We have a few folks with microphones um, who can come around. And when I call on you, if you could um, tell us your name and your affiliation. And we'll start right here in the back. Uh, hi, Pastor Britt, Renaissance Institute, regular around here. Uh, I've been on this earth long enough to uh, watch NATO from the beginning. And I've, in my thinking, I've managed to divide it into two organizations, completely separate. I call them micro and macro. Uh, the first micro uh, NATO would have been the one that existed for that first 40 years you talked about, when there was no fighting done, etc., no warring or whatever. And the macro one has been when this expansion started to take place, when we started to bring people in, or tried to, from 1,500 miles away from the North Atlantic. And it appears, from an outsider's standpoint, that ma macro uh, NATO has become more or less an antagonist or an aggressor. Is that some of the reason you think that some people have started to back away? And am I correct? I may not be. <coughs> well, I'm, I'm uh, proud you have mentioned the NATO since the beginning, although you look younger than 65 <laughs> years <laughs> old. <laughs> okay. Um, so, um, mm, I will just tell uh, my country's viewpoint on international missions. <coughs> when in Estonia we uh, explain to the public why we are abroad, why we send our boys and women uh, to the Afghanistan, to Iraq, and well, to the Africa, why we are doing it. So um, we are saying we are doing it in the sake of the liberty of our country. They are defending the liberty of our country there. Uh, and they are doing it so that uh, the most practical way in the modern world is to solve the crisis in the uh, area where the crisis occurs. And uh, if the crisis will uh, rise bigger and bigger, it will also uh, uh, put uh, to the handcuffs uh, the NATO and all the allies to act. So this is something I will uh, not... Uh, uh, take the position to say this like, like so is something like we see as a NATO as an aggressor. We, in all cases, know that uh, uh, the humanitarian need and uh, the uh, democratic values, why the NATO acts in uh, in different uh, uh, scenarios, uh, those are uh, those are far uh, justified to my understanding of the principles of uh, liberty, uh, dignity of humans, 
and uh, humanitarian reasons. Mm -hmm. Okay. See, all the way in the back on the other side. Stephen Blank, American Foreign Policy Council. You mentioned that the Baltic is the only region in Europe where NATO's, uh, NATO suffers from the, uh, a minority position that the balance is against NATO thanks to Russia. In which ways can, uh, does the balance work on behalf of Russia and against NATO? <clears throat> well, um, I will just uh, mention some uh, figures and uh, the, uh, which uh, show that a certain uh, balance uh, or the security situation in our region, the Baltic Sea region, is uh, like uh, turning in, uh, in coming, uh, coming time and has turned in uh, near past uh, uh, not in favor of the NATO uh, allies in the region. During the four last years, um, Russia has doubled its uh, strategic weaponry in our uh, region. Um, if, we, uh, if I say that steadfast chess, where took part uh, about 6,000 NATO troops, was the biggest Article uh, 5 scenario exercise uh, after the Cold War. So was the Zapad 2013 also the biggest, uh, I would say, aggressive t scenario based of the, t towards West uh, uh, exercise uh, after the Cold War, where we estimate uh, took part uh, both uh, reserve uh, troops uh, uh, and uh, altogether about uh, 100,000 uh, troops. So mm, there are a list of uh, different uh, activities from the Russian side. Uh, what we see that uh, uh, in, a, in a historical sense, uh, in the Western dimension and the Western military region uh, in Russia, there is a, uh, this is one of the priority uh, regions of Russia. To, to invest to defense. And uh, in addition to that, it has been turned also a priority to in a, in a future way. Whether it will be a um, uh, danger or not, this is a solely now a political question. But from the military viewpoint, we understand that the balance is turning now uh, not in favor of NATO in our region. And this is a reality we face. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Eric Tamerlani at the Friends Committee on National Legislation. Um, when you mention the kinds of things that the United States can do to ensure the U.S.'s commitment to NATO's security, I thought it was interesting that you didn't mention um, the presence of the United States tactical nuclear weapons in uh, Belgium, Germany, Italy, the Netherlands, and Turkey. So I'm wondering, with the end of the Cold War and with declining defense budgets both here and in NATO member states, keeping those things in mind, um, do you think NATO can adapt its nuclear sharing arrangement with the United States to reflect the threat environment of the 21st century? And, uh, and what sta uh, steps could the U.S. take to assure NATO security without the presence of tactical nuclear weapons in Europe? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, um, I would say I'm um, op a realist about the um, near future, also about the uh, uh, nuclear weaponry and also about the uh, nuclear power balance, uh, uh, also looking to the tactical uh, uh, nuclear weapons. So. Uh, Nuclear deterrence is badly needed, uh, I think, for the NATO. And so, uh, so uh, if I didn't mention it in my speech, I will do it now. Uh, surely it is a uh, uh, very valuable uh, role uh, which uh, U.S. produces to the uh, security of alliance. And uh, the reality is also that uh, uh, nuclear... Uh, mm, weaponry is very clearly seen also in the Russian Federation's 
defense strategy, where they say that, uh, or there have been comments that uh, if the U.S. Uh, fights against, indeed, or wants to diminish the uh, nuclear uh, weaponry, so it's the only, uh, it's, it's the only because of uh, uh, in a. Uh, order any weaponry, U.S. will have then uh, more, uh, more power. Um, so uh, reality is that uh, Russian Federation, uh, in looking from our region's viewpoint, will have nuclear weaponry in their uh, strategic military thinking using uh, the tactical uh, nuclear weapons if the situation in fourth, uh, war theater will demand it. Is, uh, is is very um, uh, were sound way to use use it uh, from the military planning uh, viewpoint, and uh, this is something we are aware. Thank you. The evolution of Russian military doctrine m seeming to be moving more into a even more nuclear dependent uh, approach. How do you think? I mean, it, it, particularly given where you are in the region, um, what are the most worrisome trends in terms of Russian military thinking in general? What worries you the most? I, I think um, something, um, uh, um, first of all, I, I want to not be like paranoid. Mm -hmm. I, I would say that uh, the, the danger of the military uh, actions uh, or military conflict in our region is not uh, is not surely is uh, is uh, very very low uh, today, uh, but uh, reality is that uh, what we see uh, problematic is that uh, or, or the in Russian uh, strategical thinking uh, to achieve the uh, political uh, aims uh, taking in and to help of. Uh, military means is uh, is quite uh, justified that and secondly uh, for, for their military thinking the main danger is actually a uh, military attack from the west side from the NATO side to Russian soil this is surely a second one uh, and thirdly I think uh, that this uh, the problem is uh, the lack of uh, transparency. I think in their way of thinking, uh, in the way of decision making, and in the way of uh, what they would achieve in the global uh, politics. And why, when I mentioned that uh, in our region, um, our, the military balance uh, is minor or negative towards NATO comparing to Ro Russian Federation troops, it could also, it could produce also the situations where the uh, mm, dangerous situation could appear, not because of vis-a-vis -vis, uh, problems between uh, Russia and uh, Estonia, or Russia and Latvia, but uh, because it is a uh, area where it would be easiest to just to, uh, uh, to take a certain, to rebalance in the global sphere situation.
military security cooperation. And so it is a, as always, finding a balance. And, but now we have turned indeed a step forward, and uh, that's something positive. Okay, I think we have time for two more. So let's come right over here. The sphere of Kremlin, uh, NOVA, is indeed a uh, European uh, uh, values and uh, Western uh, values uh, orientated uh, group of countries. Uh, so, uh, Ukrainian uh, mm, situation is very clear. I think uh, we understand, uh, um, unfortunately, what the Putin plans. Putin uh, wants to build uh, in the ruins of former Soviet Union the uh, new uh, block of, uh, of countries uh, where, where a strategic role surely plays Ukraine. And uh, they are using, I think, all the means uh, to achieve uh, that aim. Mm. And I, I think what is very important uh, that uh, the Western uh, leaders and uh, also the public audience should send a very clear message. The first message is indeed to Kremlin that it is uh, unacceptable uh, to influence uh, uh, the independent countries to make the uh, options about the countries and nations' future. And the second is also that it is solely unacceptable to use violence mm, against its own people. Um, and this is the message uh, which needed to be given to the uh, Yanukovych uh, government. And um, I'm not very optimistic about the uh, coming uh, weeks and months uh, outcomes in Maidan. Because uh, the opposition is uh, also fragmented. It, it, um, uh, the, uh, you have to be always uh, uh, careful with red lines where you put it. Opposition has put several red lines, demanded several uh, different issues. But uh, I think um, um, if. Uh, the opposition is able to to, to get the uh, uh, different structure uh, and uh, leader uh, re one le real leader to unite it. So I think it could be a real challenge to uh, to Yanukovych, and I would be sp sp uh, rather suspicious uh, to say mildly that Yanukovych would. Uh, move that country to Europe. No, he will not do it. And the different question will be, uh, the culturally, it is not a case where Europe, the uh, uh, union of values, could, uh, could take uh, one uh, uh, country just on the principles of uh, money or the need of money. So this is not a, just a, uh, a marketplace. But this is a union of values, Europe. And this is, I, I think, the, 
the fatal mistake what Yanukovych actually has, has made. Thank you. Okay. okay, final question. Um, you've noted cyber is increasingly important and that since you are hitting your 2% threshold, I'm just curious if you could elaborate a bit on your own uh, uh, capability priorities. Um, our, you mean military capability priorities? Uh, military capability, for, our, for us, it is the most important is uh, uh, rapid reaction capability for us what we have learned from the Georgian war, what we have learned from the philosophy of modern warfare is indeed that crisis could occur with, within the days. And so we need to be ready to act and um, also to give uh, our allies a chance when the collective defense uh, model would, uh, would uh, Article 5 would start uh, the chance to, 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 to pass decisions and, uh, and make lo logistical uh, uh, mm, movements. Mm, so um, we in Estonia are, as we are moving against the tide in uh, uh, sense of uh, investing to defense, there's also one uh, element where I think we are in the modern world uh, in a minority group of countries. Uh, we in Estonia believe strongly in national conscription system. And we have remained it in Estonia, although after we joined to the uh, NATO, it has, it, there was also the academic discussion whether it is like practical to continue that. But but fact is that 90% of Estonians support it, not because it is a most cost-efficient way we could hold a reserve army of uh, also having a rapid reaction capability but because there's also a strong moral dimension that free men are uh, taking the duty to defend their country. Th this is something very, like I think, uh, very important to students, also because m w very strongly because of our historical painful uh, uh, reasons. And so our plan is uh, during the next decade to establish uh, 21 thousand rapid reaction uh, troops uh, army. So if we touch the button, so with, within very short time frame, we will have such an uh, army. And it was based on the reservists. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for covering um, such a great amount of ground with us today for your for your talk and for your interaction, and also for the great partnership and alliance that we have with Estonia. Uh, thank you very much. And please join me in a round of applause for thanking the minister. Thank you. I was very privileged to be here. And, and the very, I'm very happy to receive you here. All. So thank you very much indeed. So thank you indeed. Yeah.